Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Those of you who joined right on time, thank you for dealing with my technical difficulties. But thank you very much, all of you, for joining us for our monthly Indigenous film series. I am Jean Schumann from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science, as always, is very pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management to present Indigenous film. As you watch the presentation tonight, please, please keep putting your questions and comments in the chat. We'll be watching those throughout the event and we would love to hear what you have to say. But for now, I'll go ahead and stop talking and introduce Jean Rubin. She is the director of the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Jean, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Welcome everyone. This is uh, part of our 19th annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival which is presented by the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. I direct the festival with me is Merv Tano, who is uh, president of our institute. We are delighted you could join us for tonight's program of short films. As always, I will start by acknowledging some of the many people and organizations that make the festival possible. Uh, for starters, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, they have been hosting our film programs for many, many years, and they were able to help us transition to virtual events uh, without a hitch. So we really appreciate uh, those efforts so we could continue to bring you the festival. Our thanks to Jean, who's tonight's on-air host, and the multitude of folks who are working behind the scenes uh, at the museum to, to bring you tonight's program. Of course, we could not bring you the festival without the support of our many sponsors and community partners. You saw their logos rolling uh, on the screen as you logged in. Our major sponsors this year are Colorado Creative Industries, Kanika Minolta, AARP, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. Uh, thanks to all of our sponsors and also all of our community partners. This year's festival theme is Our Stories. We're going to start tonight's program with three short films, and then we're, uh, when we come back, we'll have a conversation with the three filmmakers. Uh, we're gonna focus on their art and craft of filmmaking. Uh, the films we have, we'll run, we'll run them all in sequence. The first is Our Wonderful Land from director Nicholas Reynaud. Uh, next, we have Savage Future from director Terry Jones. And uh, third in the lineup is Mokaji. G uh, I'm sorry, Greg. I'm trying. I'm trying to get this right. Mokaji Gay, and Craig Commanda, the filmmaker, will give you a better pronunciation when he comes back. After the films, uh, it's about 15 minutes of film time. After the films, we'll come back and start our conversation. This is where I usually say roll the films, and Merv keeps reminding me that nothing actually rolls these days. So in recognition that we are in the 21st century, let's press the play button. Wow, such an interesting collection of films. Um, I'm glad we were able to to show these to everybody. Uh, I am going to introduce the three filmmakers and I'm just, uh, we'll introduce them in the order in which we saw the films. <clears throat> uh, first is Nick. Oh. They, they, they need to uh, get their videos. So. Oh, they'll, uh, they'll come up as we, oh, as we oh, introduce okay. them. Hey, these guys are filmmakers. They know right. how to do this. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Renault. Uh, Nicholas lives in Montreal. He's a filmmaker, installation artist, and assistant professor in Indigenous Studies at Concordia University. He's been making documentary and experimental work for the past 25 years. His film, Brave New River, earned him the award for best first Canadian feature-length documentary at the 2013 Hot Docs Festival in Toronto. He's of mixed Indigenous and Quebecois heritage and is a member of the Huron Wendat First Nation of Wendaki. Uh, for those of you in the audience who attended our 2019 film festival, uh, you might have uh, seen his film, Ursan, that we screened. The second film was from Terry Jones. 
Terry is a member of the Seneca Nation of Indians and founder of Torn Jersey Media, an independent indigenous media production company. He strives to find a balance between entertaining and educating his audiences. So you're in the right place tonight. <laughs> That's what we like to do too. His short films have been screened at film fests worldwide. And what's interesting is they continue to screen for years after they're produced. They just yeah. stay in demand. One of his most acclaimed works, Soup for My Brother, was named Best Documentary at the 2016 Liverpool International Film Festival in the UK. Uh, he recently curated the Havnashani Micro Short Film Program that screened in Buffalo, New York last month and will have an encore screening at the Seneca uh, Niagara Casino in November. Uh, we've screened a number of Terry's films at our film festivals and in our Indigenous um, monthly film series. Our third filmmaker, uh, Craig Commanda, is from Kitagon Zibi. He's a multidisciplinary artist in film, music, beadwork, photography, and hide tanning. I first became aware of Craig's films through the Wapakoni Mobile Program uh, when he started as a, as a student filmmaker. And again, we've screened several of his films in our festival programs. So in addition to knowing these three filmmakers through their films, Merv and I have met each of them at First People's Festival in Montreal. So this is a happy little reunion for us. Mm -hmm. And so guys, well, we, we've had occasion to chat with you privately about your films and filmmaking. Uh, we really welcome this opportunity to have you share all of your insights and perspectives with our audience. So welcome. Um, glad to have you with us. I think um, just to, to start the conversation and to help folks get to know you a little better, uh, we'd just like to ask each of you if you could talk a little bit about how you got started in filmmaking and you know the path that, that got you to where you are today. Somebody want to jump in and start? Sure, uh, I can start. Uh, just sorry about that, I had some audio issues. Um, yeah, so um, I started in, let's see, like 20, 2009 was when I made a film with someone else, but as a filmmaker who like, you know, when I started really seriously making films was I would say in 2013. And the reason I made films or I started making film then was because I needed, or rather the film served as a uh, vehicle for art therapy for me. And it helped me to process my emotions and to uh, gain some perspective on myself because I was going through like a major depression at, at that time in my life. So um, I was feeling pretty lost and uh, making the film that I made at that time called The Weight, that film helped me to like tell my story and to just even stimulate conversation around uh, mental health, mental illness and things like that, depression, anxiety, all that stuff. And so first film uh, film had served as uh, a way for me to help myself. And then it, 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 uh, it became something that I, I could use to sort of like examine philosophies, ask questions that people are talking about, you know, that people are talking about identity. And I've had my struggles with it too in terms of uh, placing myself and film helped me to to talk about it and to process it in a way that uh, would allow uh, for other people to jump in on the conversation because I know that many people have had the same experiences as me as well as uh, the same questions um, and lately now I, I, I pursue art as a, as, a, as a thing in itself and I try to or I'm, I'm exploring abstract work as it were so um, I'm still trying to find my voice but for me uh, film was a way that I could express my voice uh, in general. Thanks for the question. So Craig, I want to let you know, we we screened uh, your film, The Weight, and also Call and Response 
in both, both our general screenings and also in youth programs. And I know from, the, from being there, uh, especially with, with the youth, that your message resonated with a lot of Native kids and, and non-Native kids as well. And I think uh, the fact that you, you, you put that, you shared, you shared those thoughts and those emotions and feelings and concerns uh, in a film uh, helped, helped a lot of kids uh, who are struggling with some of those same issues. Thank I don't you know if you always get them, if you always get feedback when the films go out, but um, they were well received and well appreciated. Thank you very much for telling me that. I'm very honored. Um, it was always my intention that my films would have meaning for people that, you know, they would get my message and that, uh, yeah, for, for a moment in time, people don't feel so alone in um, the things they're going through. Yeah, I, uh, that's all I've ever wanted, I think, from my films and how I think, how I would say I determine my success as a filmmaker is, is things like that. If someone gets help or someone understands something from what I did more than any other award, I would say. And uh, I've always maintained that because having someone around for longer is uh, a much bigger joy for me than any gold I get. Yeah. Good. Good. Terry, you want to? Mm -hmm. I'll go next. <clears throat> sure. Um, growing up as a young res kid, growing up on the reservation, um, I love school. Uh, I loved everything about it, math, science, English, but um, those are the exact things that uh, Indian kids on my reserve tended not to do. So it wasn't so much that I felt different um, as I, um, one of my short films called Untitled Unlabeled, I reveal that it wasn't that I felt different, I was told I was different. And it was at that time when I sort of realized that um, maybe my worldview or how I, how I was going to in the future interact with the outside world is different from everyone else's. And for me, on this ter on my territory is lacrosse. Lacrosse, the sport, is the is the rite of passage to being, you know, a, a young adult. And uh, I don't know if it had something to do with me being left-handed, but I played lacrosse once, and that was it for me. Um, okay. And even then, it was a choice between academics or uh, re uh, lacrosse rehearsals or lacrosse practice and games, of kind of like interfering with school. So I just went on that route. But it wasn't until I was um, uh, like 14 or 15, the federal government had Johnson O'Malley programs where they introduced us to photojournalism. So we had a 35 millimeter dark room. Uh, we were record reporters. We went around the res to find stories about the lacrosse games, the ones that I did play in, uh, like the bridges, you know, construction that was going on, the bingo hall. Um, but as an artist, uh, you know, the moving image always interested me, but it wasn't one, it wasn't accessible then. Same with like a lot of technologies, whether it was photography, the film camera, the video camera, those were, when they were introduced, uh, they pe marginalized people really couldn't afford it or have access to it. So, um, and it's also for me, a little bit of uh, society, the dominant culture kind of saying that you have to have success and youth and beauty and all of that when you're young. Um, and it wasn't until things went from analog to dig digital when I finally felt my brain, because it was book smart on one end, but it was like, it wasn't developed yet as, as in the creative side. So finally, the ones and zeros allowed me to completely nerd out and, and satisfy the analog part of my brain. But then there was this other new uh, part of myself of creativity in, in digital media that allowed me to, uh, to, to kind of like satisfy both minds. And 10 years ago, 2012, I went, uh, started school at, the, at Syracuse University in their film program uh, through the generous support of the Haudenosaunee, micro, uh, no, the Haudenosaunee Promise Scholarship. Uh, allowed me, afforded me to go to that university. I graduated with uh, summa cum laude. Uh, and then just recently, last month, I just started uh, my MFA in film at York University in Toronto. So I'm, uh, I'm on my way in terms of... Uh, uh, being uh, grateful that at this point in my life, like I'm, I feel like I'm finally found my way, and and I find ways of expressing myself in in, uh, in narrative, documentary, and experimental. So yeah. Okay. Nicholas, can we hear from you? Hi. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so thanks for this uh, event, for this invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be with these uh, two fellows. Uh, I, I, I've seen uh, Craig's work 
Uh, I've seen his beaded work too, um, and and uh, heard him play music once uh, as well. Um, and I, I used to program films at the Montreal First Peoples Festival. So one year I programmed uh, Soup for My Brother and Empire State by Terry. And I, I showed them in, in class at Concordia University uh, also. Uh, so for me, uh, well, I studied film uh, when I started university uh, from 95 to 99 at Concordia University filmmaking. Um, there was no, uh, uh, no clear uh, vision or goal. Um, I, I, I came from a household where there was no book, no art, um, and, and the native side of the family all did craft, but for me that was the stuff for tourists at the time, you know, they were making moccasins and snowshoes for the shops. Um, and I liked visual arts and I liked music and literature and, you know, just naively I thought, well, film can uh, bring all these things <laughs> in one, in a way, and it's kind of the popular art that's around. Uh, so I went into filmmaking uh, for, for that at first, naively. So after that, I, I mostly did uh, installation work in, involving video all the time, but more like visual art, contemporary art. And then I came back to filmmaking. Uh, I got some funding, but I found that so heavy to make documentaries, needing money, um it's heavy technology i mean it's not like picking up a brush or a guitar you know it's 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 a heavy process so i made a couple of those documentaries with funding that take one two three years of your life um and, and then finally in recent years i got back into making more of these kind of homemade crafty little films with very little or no no funding and and uh, I feel less anxious about uh, film projects. I, maybe there'll be other like feature land documentaries, but but uh, uh, there's there's also ways to make images, moving images uh, that can tell things and make people uh, feel things. So I, I I guess I I like the sensory experience of it. That's my main thing. If not, I could just write, but 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 I like I like the full sensory experience of uh, of filmmaking to share that. Thank you. So, you know, when we were putting together this this program, I, I went back to to our website, and I was looking at a question that Merv posed on our website, and he says, "Why is a law and policy research institute?" organizing a film festival. Uh, and he answers it this way. He says, we're involved because film, especially good film, and especially film written, made, and directed by indigenous peoples is perhaps the most expressive medium we have for communi communicating messages about who we were, who we are, and who we are striving to become. Film lets us talk story. It lets us convey to others our unique perspective of the universe and all the creatures, places, and things within. Film lets the viewers see with our eyes and how we are connected to each other and to past and future generations in more compelling ways than mere words permit. And I feel like when I, when I see the, the kind of films that you folks create, they seem, they, they come so much from the heart and they seem like such passion projects. And I just wonder if you can just talk about, you know, sort of a in, in a philosophical sense, why do you make film? Can I, I add mean, something? We, sure, sure. Because uh, uh, <laughs> there's the intent, the objective of the of the artist, the creator says, here is my work. And here's what I intended to convey. And yet, I've seen some of these more than one time. Uh, and the message changes. 
it uh, the, the the context changes and, and therefore the the message changes and what i i liked about the film uh, is that you, you could look at that and depending on where you the 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 receptor were in your life the the message changes uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if you, you all, in, in answering Gene's question, can address that that part of uh, uh, your work as well. I guess I could compare it to uh, when I pick up one of my sculptures, or even even in some of the beads that I use, there are different faces that are cut into it in order to reflect light. Um, and for me, when I look at these these in a different light or in different shades of light or at a different angle, I'm always seeing something different of the art. And for me uh, in life too, and in film, I should say more specifically, um, I like that my work can be examined in new and different ways. Cause even myself as the creator, um, time passes when I make these things and I grow and change. And when I look back on the work, I can, uh, how would you say, get like a bird's eye view of it all. And it, it sort of makes me feel a little different. You know, my understanding of things have changed. Um, yeah, so I definitely, hmm. and why I make films was to uh, make meaning, not just for myself, but for other people too. If I was to um, sum it up <laughs> in that way. Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Sure. Well, uh, I could, uh, I, I just thought of, uh, sorry to bring in a French philosopher, but I just thought of a quote I always loved about uh, the, this idea of, you know, what, what, what is what, what is the, the, is there a direct channel between the artist intention and, and, and uh, the receiver? And uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, to kind of get around that, once said, a work of art is pregnant with all of its interpretation. So it's not, it's not whatever you want. It's not all relativism, but it could be many things. But the work was pregnant with with, with it all. Uh, so I like that. Uh, what what you said just uh, it just kind of was revealed to me uh, a few days ago as I showed it in in uh, in the community in Wendaki and and. Uh, uh, there was a few different people and people from outside the community and, and uh, uh, the Quebecer uh, audience, some people said to me about the last character carrying uh, someone on their back. They're like, oh, it's the indigenous tradition of uh, caring for elders. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, it can, yes, it can be that. Uh, but for me, the two quotes I have at the end, it's that ambiguity of carrying someone on, on your back. Uh, you have the Jacques Cartier relating uh, uh, what was likely a mark of hospitality by the Haudenosaunee people on Montreal Island. As he says, they carried our man piggyback. And the other quote by when that poet Jean Siwi, who's my dad's cousin, when he says, uh, I write about the, the, the mountains and the lakes that my father looked at while carrying a white man on his back, uh, is not talking about a uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sign of hospitality. He's, he's talking about a lifetime of being exploited and uh, being oppressed. Um, so I had that uh, the, the audience member telling me that, and then uh, someone else who, who works, who's uh, an indigenous of another nation and works in an institution said, oh, I related to that because I feel like I carry settlers on my back all the time. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm like, okay, that's that's wonderful if uh, you connected with it with it that way. So yeah, that's just an example that with this little film, that those 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 very different interpretations are are possible. I don't want I don't want to say any is wrong. They they're possible. And there's another thing I've been thinking about too. Is that um, so? What about like intrinsic meaning as related to art? You know, I've been, I've been thinking about like, can I just make something and it have its own meaning? And uh, does it have its own life? That sort of thing. But mostly, like, what what 
that really means? Does it does my work always have to mean something, or can I make art for the just as it is? And like you know, especially as an indigenous person, does it do I always have to be? Um, I have to be like making art about something, or like my art is always politicized because I live in a system that politicizes me. You know, we live in this country under the Indian Act, well here in Canada anyway. Um, things like that. Um, so I've just been kind of thinking of these things as I do art. Like the more time goes on and the more I make art, uh, I think about questions like that too. So I just kind of wanted to bring it up. Uh, for me, <clears throat> in terms of context, I mean, a lot of my films that I did in undergrad, there's probably 11 class assignments that I made as class assignments, not as like, I'm going to submit these into festivals. The whole idea was learning. Uh, getting critical feedback, and uh, it was it's been since six years since I graduated from uh, Syracuse was, and I saw its reception at film festivals. That I realized that I've had to, I really had to grow into this idea that um, as I was learning, I was creating an aesthetic, a style, um, pacing, but the editing, like uh, those things work. And you know, when I, um, as Nicholas had mentioned before about Empire State, you know, we made that as, I mean, I was older, but we made that as our freshman, you know, uh, final year portfolio review project. And when I watch it to today, it, it almost feels like a political film because it's just my dad in front of a TV watching 9-11 happen. And then he's watching the Shakanan, the Iraq war invasion, and then like the, the human cost of war. Um, it's very poignant, but then people, when they watch it, I've heard feedback where they said it's very quiet, but it, the soundscape is just all news footage and then bombs dropping. But I think it more has to do with my dad as being like this grounding presence on, on screen, like in Suit for My Brother, He's, you know, he was in both. And with my latest um, short film, Savage Future, uh, I did that as a class assignment nine years ago, and it's been sitting as my other projects were getting their time, I guess, at festivals, um, I'm like, I, I knew I had um, kind of like stand in uh, images and same with researching the iconic images from Carlisle to make sure those I could use those and those were public domain. Um, I, I, I didn't do much with the editing that that I did back then. Um, but to think of how the context changes, it's it's. Um, as I said, it's an, it, for me, it was an exercise in seeing if I could tell this story in still images with one word uh, text on each image and see if I could compose them in a way that allows the viewer to have, to create their own narrative. Uh, but it is something that's personal to me. But um, I, yeah, it's just interesting to hear feedback when people have what they take away from it um, in terms of like what they, what they see. Um, and what's interesting too with making art is being intangible. For me, it's like, it's especially digital video or digital film, it's intangible. So where does it line up alongside the, the physical forms? And I'm like, yeah, it's a bunch of ones and zeros. So I think of my legacy and I'm like, where are these gonna, you know, while my hard drives that houses all of my film projects, uh, will it be relevant after I'm gone? You know who's gonna who's gonna be the caretaker of those? How do I preserve those ones and zeros? And um, uh, that's so I think the one thing that scares me is like where is it gonna be? Where is it gonna land? Because it's not technically uh, physical. But you've expressed that in the film too, right? Yes, that was Ode to the Nine. <laughs> yeah, that one too. It's uh, it's like I I have my own digital archive of all these terabytes. I call them Terry bytes. Um, dad joke um not that i'm a dad but <laughs> but it's um yeah what's gonna happen to them um you know and the only thing that i could at the end of the film the only thing i could i could hopefully leave for the future is say the past is beautiful i wish you were here because when i look at uh older images black and white images where you just have the image uh we don't have the sight and sound we don't have the live experience human experience and you know, not to get too academic about it, but when you think about film and video, it's only engaging our two senses. It's our sight and sound. Um, when, when whatever you're capturing, if, if it's an image or, or still image, you know, there's, there's a smell, there's a, there's a taste, there's a touch that goes along with it. So, you know, I feel like the form in itself, I mean, now we're getting to VR where we, we get closer to that five, um, 
waiting for smell aroma to come out, but or odorama, but um, but to get yourself to be even more um, in, encased in the environment that, that you're that you're showing. So. So you know, one of the things that that really drew me to uh, this film, Savage Future, that that we screened, was how how you took you can tell the essence of the boarding school story in three minutes, no dialogue, no narration. And you, you know, people have done full length documentaries to get mm -hmm. that message across and you've, you've captured it just mm -hmm. so concisely. Uh, we have a question from the audience. It, it fits in here, I think, real well. Somebody wanted uh, to know if, if you could uh, talk about uh, the people, the portraits and the photographs in the film. Oh, sure, sure. Asking, uh, these relatives. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, when I when I when I think this this project that I created in undergrad was more about we were exploring uh, experimental, so it was like along with the lines of Edward um, no Walter Murch uh, who talked about who wrote a book in the blink of an, uh, blink of an eye where we edit kind of we edit naturally with our eyes and I did another short film called Geek Squad how I lost my Indian name where I tell a story and then I change the image as I'm blinking. Um, but it's, it's not revealed. So unless you actually see that, there's something that feels like uh, comfortable with it. Well, with this one, I wanted to play with sound and that's where I shook the Indian corn to, um, to, to the smoke dance and then put it on a timeline, slowed it way down and just edited it to that. And if I can just share this right now. So this is sort of, it's almost like a structural thing. This is like, let me get a little closer. Like this is my little roadmap to uh, when I made Savage Future in terms of like swapping the images in and out, when to do it, make sure it wasn't repeated and then re reversing it. But the, but the people, so one of the first things when I did undergrad was that they, I, the, the comment I got was, we don't feel you in the film, this other film. We only see, um, we only, we only see words and images and you telling us something. So this was like my first foray into the, doing that. Um, my mom went to residential school and the, um, and for me, uh, in order to tell the story, she's like the central figure because, uh, she never, she grew up with asking me from time to time, she's like, was I a good mother? Because she doesn't have that, that concept. She went to Thomas Indian school when she was four. And then, uh, she left when she was 12 and then she went to, uh, then she went to an orphanage. And uh, it was like so those sort of things that I put into the to um, as turning it from the micro of my personal family and then going into the macro and then going back to the micro, but hopefully recontextualizing the initial images that look cute when you first see my niece, but then it has a different meaning when you see the same image at the end. Did we lose everybody? <laughs> I'm still here, but I think we lost Merv and Jeannie. Yeah, I think we lost Merv and Jean, but I would mm. love to keep this conversation going. I just don't have their questions. <laughs> so if there's anything else that you would like to talk about, your bead work, any more of your films, I, I would love to hear that. Please don't let that end. And I'm, I'm gonna check and see if we can get them back. Sure, sure. I'm sure they'll, they'll be back soon enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Are all three of you in Canada right now? I am. Um, I'm on Seneca territory at the moment. Uh, I go back and forth. I do have an on-campus apartment, uh, but I'm slowly transitioning into being a student. Full time. I am a full time student, but being more based in, in Toronto. I think once the weather turns wintry, I'm not going to have the option of uh, driving back and forth two and a half hours easy back back and forth. But the nice thing about those trips is like I can ponder my next projects, my thesis film, and I have to shoot another film for this uh, this term. So um, uh, I'm kind of like straddling the border between US and Canada. Wow. I, uh, I'm based in Montreal, but uh, I'm out of town for a little yeah. bit. Yeah, doing a high camp right now, actually. <laughs> a little like education thing with me and uh, our crew that I'm part of, the Buckskin Babes. And uh, yeah, we're, we're a collective that we started in Montreal a couple of years back. And uh, so we learned together how to process hide. It's been a really great adventure so far. 
and uh, I've been loving every second of it. It brings me closer to culture, my culture, and um, yeah, I uh, experience a lot of joy from it. Yeah, I also oh. do food too. <laughs> Beautiful. And Nicola, I'm pretty sure you're in Quebec, yes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, we're in the middle of the semester. I teach at Concordia, so uh, <laughs> I have to be in Montreal. Um, yeah, well, I can add something to uh, stuff, to, to do a bit of mileage on, on, the, on the last question uh, and what everyone was bringing that. up and what Craig was saying also about meaning or just making and all of that. There's something... Uh, I think very interesting, very fulfilling uh, and disappointing at the same time. I don't know how to, to gauge that, but we probably all do that where we put a lot of things in a work that we have to uh, because we care about it, but no one will connect to those details. <laughs> like there's a lot of decisions uh, and no one will. So for, for that little animation film, it's the first time I tried animation so that the animation itself it's a little clunky. It's really binary, <laughs> like one, two, but I, I was okay with it. And uh, Alex uh, van der Dunk Ferrand also as uh, when that ancestry did, did the drawings and it was the right style, kind of children history book. Uh, uh, and I loved it, but everything is there and is everything in there is documentary. Like every character is based on an archive photo of the community. Uh, every plant, is something I looked at on that land, uh, the Labrador teen flower, the 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 kind of lichen that hangs like hair from from spruce trees, uh, the the spruce grouse, uh, the fern, a uh, couple kinds of moss and the variations of color. The soundtrack is the same. Everything is documentary about <laughs> the birds that live on that land. So, just to say, no one cares about that. It could be a generic, like burns, you know, forest ambient soundtrack, uh, generic green that looks like, you know, like Northern Quebec boreal forest, and that would be okay. But for me, that was part of the fun, and I, 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 I couldn't. It wouldn't make as much sense if it, if it wasn't like that, if it wasn't a self reflection kind, kind of thing. So, yeah, I really, yeah, I love. I gotta say, um, I really enjoyed both films that I watched. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I felt that I, like I agree with you. Like I felt the animation style was just right. You know, it was able to tell the story. If it was a little more smoother, I think it would go against like the the the. <laughs> you know, it it has to remain at that level in order for the story to be properly told. Um, and I really felt that with that work. So yeah, and Terry, I really liked your work because I was thinking about doing a project in terms of like, so how can I like use photos to sort of like tell a story through film? You know what I mean? And I was thinking about that and then I saw your work and how you did it and uh, I was very inspired by it. So I just wanted to let you know, thank you very much for that. Yeah, I was inspired by all three. I absolutely agree with what you just said, Greg. I mean, all of them there was this similarity. It was almost as if all three of you worked together on them of this imagery and sound working together. They weren't the same images, but there was this beautiful through line in all three films. I thought they were just so beautifully put together. Yeah, I really appreciated. Oh, good. Oh, just quick. I was just going to say, I'm sure all of us thought of sound for the ideal setting of a movie theater mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's okay it, it plays in all these contexts and it goes through a computer screen online it's fine too so I, I wish I get to hear even if Terry's very rhythmical and simple I wish I get to hear that in a screening room and I did get to to hear Craig's uh in a screening room and mm -hmm. there was so many layers in that soundtrack uh so yeah great work both sorry Terry go ahead Oh yeah, no, no. Again, yeah, like, um, yeah, I loved everybody's work. Um, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but in terms of like, as well, I, without knowing the back image with Nicholas, your uh, the the meaning behind everything to the casual viewer, sometimes it can come across as being simple, and thinking I could compose 24 images in a certain way, but yet it has it's like almost like synergy, the the simplistic 
combination of them addition adds up to more than what they add up. It's more than 24 images. Same with uh, Craig's piece as well. It, it can seem simple, but at the same time, I kept feeling deeper meaning that I was feeling that, that I know you, as artists that you put in there. But it's funny because people are like, oh, sometimes my work is like, it's a simple story told well. But I'm like, no, everything has a meaning. Every action, every nothing's on screen more or less unless it has a purpose. It's not just picking up your camera and just shooting and having someone act in front of it. It's, it's, it's more than that. So I sometimes wear it as a badge of honor to say, oh, it's simple, but it's well told. I'm like, oh, but it's way more complex than you think. And the casual viewer might only pick up the, 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 you know, the base meaning. But indigenous people will sometimes they'll feel the the, the deepness of 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 what we intend for it to be there. But uh, multiple interpretations of of the same of the same work, you know. Oh, absolutely, and multiple interpretations within the same work. I mean, Terry, just because you brought it up, I found myself wondering what that sound was, and then it almost it was is that footsteps, and then there was almost. Um, a uh, darkness to it as we started getting into the boarding school pictures of wait what is this sound so I loved that you put that in your credits of this is what the sound that you were hearing was and it mm -hmm. you didn't change it but it changed with the images in your film that was very very cool mm -hmm. thank you all right well I'm it looks like Jean lost internet and so I don't want to keep everybody here with me going, well, what's your background? <laughs> <laughs> but if you would like to talk, if any of you would like to talk a little bit of how you touched on it just a little bit, but if you'd like to go more in depth as to how you got into making art, uh, was it generational? Was it you just decided one day that you wanted to make this and, oh, it worked and you've been on that correct path ever since? <laughs> Or you can answer a chat, answer a chat question. It looks like Lori asked, uh, would you like to talk about how filmmaking and storytelling is incorporated into our lives to honor and move us forward as indigenous people? Wonderful question. Uh, I can answer briefly. Um, am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. Um, for me, as I said, it's about entertaining and educating, but um i forgot what i was gonna say what what was the i forgot the gist of what i was gonna say something very profound and oh it was it was there. right there yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. it'll come back yeah. absolutely nicola craig if you would like to talk about how you're honoring and moving forward indigenous people by your work well um i don't know i, I think other people have, have uh a, a more how could I say, uh, a, a more lived experience with storytelling in communities, like, like I, 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 I look up to it. Um, and, and, but I, I kind of think of it more, more intellectually, because I haven't experienced the, the, the enough directly the tradition of stories living by transmission in, in the community. And the only way I try to connect with it is that uh, indigenous stories are usually uh, simple in their narrative, full of wonderful details, uh, and and very evasive but deep about their moral and ethical lessons. <laughs> so these are the kind of three paradigm that I I, I, I try to handle. I, I, I think this yeah this great wisdom um in 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 that uh and you know there's a anishinaabe writer leon simpson who says uh uh stories help us live and we live by stories and and i i forget how she says it but how it's it it, it cannot be separated from uh from from, from life and uh it, it carries knowledge and she says something like, it's something that when we share it and it's out there, once in a while we take them, we take them out and look them up together. 
she says something like that I, I really like the image she makes with that it's like you know what is how does that resonate now with how we live and how we feel and and and, and following uh, Merv's uh, earlier question too you know Simpson always talk about the fact that stories are meant to change so uh you know, she, she she tells a traditional Anishinaabe story by uh, making them uh, characters in video games or or changing the. Uh, she she told a beaver traditional story by making people uh, blocking and following each other on social media. You know, but 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 the core of the the core of the story that's hundreds of years old was still the same. Uh, so. It's all these things I have in mind, but as I say, I I, I do regret that I, I I kind of try to catch on it uh, later on intellectually. Uh, I I I regret I don't have this foundation uh, as something that comes from youth and and community sharing. We're back. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always good to. Uh... Be reminded that you're not indispensable. So I, <laughs> <laughs> carry on. <laughs> you seem to be doing fine without us. You have a question. Yeah. And actually, what happened just happened with us is uh, the gist of the question because it's about technology. Uh, and I, 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 I came back from the army. I was stationed uh, in France uh, with the U.S. Army. I came back with about, uh, uh, I think, 300 uh, mostly jazz albums. Okay. And the, the, this, those were vinyl. Uh, and then vinyl got kind of out, and uh, I had cassettes. And that got out, and then I got CDs. But then he also had streaming. And I, I, I thought about the streaming and I said, you know, one of the things I don't like about streaming uh, is uh, I am not sure exactly what my relationship is with the artist. Uh, if, if, if I buy one of these CDs, I have a sense that Terry, Nicola, and, and Craig, if there's their artists, they're going to get a piece of the action. If I start streaming, I don't know what the deal is between you all and, and Apple, right? And so, or uh, some other streaming service. So the question was, well, uh, do I just want the music or do I want, in a sense, even though you all don't know it, I want a relationship with with the artist and, and, and the art, as opposed to having a Facebook or a, or an Apple or Spotify type of relationship. Uh, because I, I, I looked at the films uh, today again, I, I said, you know, how how does animation fit in with uh, the portage? See, could you do that film in 1930 with, uh, could, could you tell that story in, in that particular way uh, in 1956? Uh, and I, 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 the, the other two films, all I could think of was the sound and how we in modern society don't have quiet, hardly have any quiet. And so you could have the, uh, uh, the turtles, right? Nature, but behind that was this, 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 this drone, the sound, and said, you know, there's, there's somebody else in there. And, and, and so the question was, 
how, how do you tell the kind of uh, story? How do you uh, create the kind of work that, that establishes that relationship uh, and, and, in a sense, cut through all of the ambient distractions to the sound, I mean, uh, to the story? Or, conversely, as I think about it, are those ambient distractions really part of the story? <laughs> I think uh... that was more of a monologue than a question, but yeah. but it really was. <laughs> I started thinking about that as uh, I was watching these. I think what you've um, touched on is like the ephemerality of. Uh, art I guess you could say like the physical like there's one thing to like screen a film that you don't have or whatever and then like to have something that was part of the film for example like like I think I can understand what you mean by having a relationship to art in that way like to have something in a relationship uh with art that's a bit intangible is it's harder to it's harder to to feel the energy of an object, let's say, or no, no, sorry, the, like like something that you can't touch versus something that you can perceive and that well you're able to touch and examine and in different ways. Um, so I really like resonate with that, um, especially when it comes to like like say for example my film, my film has those objects in it and I have those objects, and uh, you can feel when you pick them up. There's uh, there's that energy that they were created with. Um, but like looking at a picture of it online, let's say for example, uh, might not be the same thing compared to like viewing it in person, or uh, or even just viewing a digital photograph versus an analog, like a analog. <laughs> I want to say analog, but like a film photograph with the same work. There's a there's a photograph you can touch versus something that's like ones and zeros. You know? Yeah, I really um, resonate with that a lot. So thank you for that. I noticed that there was another like question in the chat too. Um, I just wanted to touch on them real, really, really quickly. Um, fundraising, uh, like in some of the film classes I've, saw, I've, I've uh, been a part of, they had like an introducing and whatnot, but um, the main stuff that I learned from was from other filmmakers that I've been at like film festivals who like when I get to talking about them, I learned more in like that like brief conversation than I have in uh, many of these. Uh, and as far as my films go, like I basically made my films on zero budget. I didn't have to really, I just used uh, my creativity in order to tell my story. And I guess the lesson for me from that is to uh, encourage everyone to use their creativity in such a way that you can, um, like it helps you to think out of the side of the box, I would say, to not have money. Like I, I know I eventually for other productions, I will need money, but I like the fact that I made something that has meaning um, to people. Uh, I made it basically on zero budget, other than the costs to like make my objects or whatnot. Yeah, I um, I like to think to myself, or I like, or I should say that um, as a part of my philosophy, I like to make films that are on cheap or zero budget because it's possible. I see it happen, and I can do it. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, I could jump in. Um, we, regarding like tangible objects and then as filmmakers or storytellers, what we're able to, even though it's not tangible, for me, I feel that in some ways, if there isn't a direct connection with the artist or you don't know them personally, I feel like there can be a deeper depth of memory or experience that you can have someone who's never seen, never met you or even never heard you um, I look at that as like one great, um, s s not side effect, but one great like element of, of being able to touch someone in a way that's not tangible versus tangible. Um, and I also, um, as well with this piece, I, there's, there's not a moving <laughs> image. It reminds me of undergrad. I, I took this, uh, we took this documentary, uh, class during the summer documentary in Italy. And yet my partner, my film partner and I, uh, we didn't shoot any any video. We just shot. We our projects were all still images that were that were edited together, or they were like uh, 
morphed into into something and then using landscapes um we got an a in the class but i know we're really pushing it in terms of like uh documentary video or film and we're doing still images but um but having strong story i mean i think an audience will forgive well 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 i mean like like with editing the editing's bad you can feel it but if the editing's good you'll just go along with the go along with the ride so i feel like with strong stories regardless of what you're using to tell it whether it is the moving image or still images or a combination of two or even vr uh, ar um if 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 it's engaging to the audience they'll go along for you know they'll go along for the ride and um and many of my pieces as i said were undergrad there, there was no budget for them and it's Funny, like I'd imagine if you, they play a couple of my films played with the international short films and you'd see the credits are just like sound design, edit, special, you know, foundations, just all these uh, support, which is great. But um, as being just somebody, a poor guy from the res, like myself, uh, you just kind of do with what you have and hopefully there's, there's an audience for it. And, and that's why I, when I give um, presentations to youth or high school or college, I'm like, this, you know, this right here, the, the iPhone or whatever you use, this is like the great equalizer. You can shoot 4K on this. Um, yeah, the depth of field might be unlimited, but they have filters. I'm learning about that yet, but yet there's uh, lenses you can use to help with that. But um, if you have a strong story and strong, and strong ideas, there's no reason why you can't do it on your own. And if I can just jump on that one, mm -hmm. I think it also speaks to the importance of having sound in our films, like a good soundtrack because it's it's such a critical part of the story. I definitely think that like if um, you were to view my film without the sound, I'm not sure that it would have the same meaning. With the sound, it helps us to understand the meaning of what I was trying to get at uh, in the work. So yeah. Yeah, well, like regarding Craig's film and, and uh, what was said and you know, in the question about uh, is the noise part of it or can we, you know, can we move past the ambient noise of the world or whatever? It's uh, like, it's, 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 it's both sad and, and inspiring in a way because yeah, in, in some of the images in Craig's film, exactly. It's like, I, I do connect with what's the, in, what's in the image. So I don't then experience it as an interference to have still the city in the background, uh, but more like, Oh yeah, that still exists. Nature is still there. That we 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 can share a world where we connect. Uh, same thing for art. You know, through all that noise, uh, we we meet in 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 those uh, worlds in the margin somehow. You know, like through the noise, we hear. Oh, some someone is singing through the noise. You know, we we hear that and we meet in in those worlds. Uh, just want to say two quick things. Uh, uh, like, why did I do animation or try that for the first time? And could I have done that before? Uh, I, I don't know about before, but uh, I know I've had for a while this idea of the ambiguity of the figure of someone carrying someone else between uh, either help and support or uh, being exploited, take it, taken advantage of. Uh, so I wanted to work with that. And it was the only way to 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 make it an image to make it a symbol without explaining it i don't want to write about it uh i don't see how i could make it fiction with with live actors you know first i wouldn't want to put uh, uh a settler person on the back of an indigenous actor uh c c carrying the low it could be a performance but um it, it, it was it was the only way uh and and then it made it a, a slow grinding process that that helped thinking and 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 complexifying the not the work but the thoughts around it in in my head and just to someone in the chat asking if they can see our work again or elsewhere or other works uh i think that uh you know the person from uh your organization uh, shared links for the three of us so I, I'm sure if, I guess like mine, I, I, there's one that's available on, on, uh, for free online. The other ones I have passwords, but I'm sure if, if you contact us through our websites, 
uh, you'll be able to find stuff or, or we can uh, consent to sharing some of the private links to see other work or see these ones again. So that would be one way because there were, there were I saw links that were posted earlier. Yeah, you know, uh, Nicola, the, uh, uh, you say portage and I see those images and uh, my, my, my mind goes to just a whole panoply of, of, of other images and events, etc. I, I, I think of Marquette, I think of Joliet, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think of Beaver, uh, I, I, I think of the, uh, the, you know, the, the 30 years war. <laughs> and I, I, I think of the Metis uh, as, as, as all kind of part of portage. Because uh, you know, was it was it who who was it that said that the, uh, those images and stories are pregnant with, uh, uh, and and that's that's how I feel about so much of uh, of uh, uh, th th this work here. It just it just uh, my mind goes in in all kinds of directions because of the, those images, those sounds, and the. Uh, and, and even just the juxtaposition of uh, of uh, characters or or, or or the images it's it's really a fascinating uh, experience to for for me to uh, uh, to to view these uh, these works it's uh, I you know I'm, I know I'm 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 babbling but it is a for me it's very rewarding and it is especially rewarding because I know you all and say it, I don't have to know those uh, ones and zeros but I know Terry you know, and I know Craig and I know Nicola and that's the connection that's important to me in the same way that this this artwork we just don't go to a gallery and say I like that and I like this and they're pretty it we want to know the artist and, and why they they did what they did in the same way uh, with your film. Well, uh, let me just add, I'm, I'm very uh, honored that you bring up uh, all that history that could be contained if, in uh, that image of, of the portage. Because of course it's, yeah, it's, it was all there in the back of my mind. It's the history of America. It's, it's the, the, the beaver pelt trade. Uh, it's it's indigenous guides leading European explorers in, into the country, and it always played on that line between uh, being free, being the guide, and helping, and suddenly realizing how much you're carrying on your back, <laughs> realizing that others are taking a ride on, on, on your back. And, and the particular history that the archive photos are from, it's from that period of late 19th century to mid 20th when uh, the government of Quebec started uh, um, pushing natives out of the woods uh, and around Quebec City where they were Wendat and Inu, uh, they created uh, two uh, provincial parks and they sent the provincial police if they were uh, Huron and, and Inu hunters, trappers still in the woods, they, they, they would uh, they would lock them up for a few days and say, did you learn the lesson now? It's now a park. You, you can't you can't do that anymore. And and uh, just before and aside from the parks, they were leasing the land to those wealthy clubs, uh, mostly Americans from New York and, and notable, like, you know, elite people from Montreal and Quebec City who would go who would create uh, uh, fish and game uh, private clubs. And then because the, the Huron and the Inu knew the land so well, they were, they, they were able to go back on the land, but hired as staff, you know? So it's, it's that very particular uh, time that was documented in some photos where it's always someone super loaded with the luggage and you see the club member walking behind with, with just his fishing rod or something like that. Uh, because they knew the land. So on those clubs, they would build a few cabins, a few lakes distance, they, and the guides knew they could get to that lake in two days and three days. Um, so yeah, it was a particular moment where you're, 
you're um uh, you have the land taken away from you and you'll go back to it because you enjoy being there but you go back to it as an employee of those who took it away from you uh so i that not everyone will get that particular reference but that's part of the thinking for me around it i relate to that a lot too because um there have been instances where uh, people who falsely claim to be indigenous or from a place uh, to me that image of the of the white man on, on my back is is very poignant because it's these uh people who pretend who take up space and resources and funding uh and everything like that who are who are really hoisting themselves without our consent on our backs and we're carrying them you know they're 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 trying to take the little that we get from us you know for clout or even worse things you know and um yeah in academia personal life in the media i see it happen and yeah that's that's how i that's how this art um resonates a lot with me because i've seen it happen and it's not just in history that happens but it's a contemporary thing even now that we are exploited in that way um caring we don't have have to yeah um that's i those are some of my thoughts on that <clears throat> thanks I, I could i could go on about academia from what you just said as as well craig because now that i'm in it with the university job um in an indigenous department uh i realize how me and my colleagues all the emails we get in a week uh about uh, filling up the spot of indigenous content on someone else's research on a panel on a university <laughs> event and and all of that it, it's such a demand and um uh it's great because things are changing and people are open to that but yeah i just realized we, we had to filter because at some point it's like people want to check the box that allows them to move up in their own career it's it's not a it's not a real interest it's not a real connection and my my uh my director to, to give me a good trick she said uh when people say uh um you know can you can you give me connections for my research in a community or can you come speak for that thing or can you she says uh ask which one of my films have you seen or what, what of my work have you read <laughs> so so it's not just that they're scanning the, the 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 directory to say uh we need to check the indigenous box uh and i thought okay that's it but it made me realize how much like yeah a lot of people are still taking a ride on 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 the back of others and cultural appropriation i mean it's been big in Canadian art world and it's the same thing than you say Craig it, it's it's the same thing as a uh, uh, fake identity you know cultural appropriation it's it's like oh your culture has made that so uh let me benefit from it now <laughs> you know so I think we're we're coming up to the end of our time as always we I don't feel want like to stop though yeah right <laughs> museum our host has to has to lock up the museum at some point thank you everybody for for joining us really appreciate you taking the, the time to share your thoughts yeah. and perspectives uh before we close i just wanted to say a, a brief word to honor uh jeff barnaby um i know our our filmmaker guests uh know uh jeff barnaby was a Mi'kmaq filmmaker who uh just passed uh recently a great loss to his family and community and to the film world, uh, well-respected, very talented filmmaker. Uh, his most recent film, Blood Quantum, was released uh, during the pandemic lockdown. And uh, just uh, a few words to, to honor Jeff and how much we'll all miss him. Thank you for that. Yeah, rest in peace, Jeff Barnaby. You know, I had met him only uh, a couple of months before um, at, at an NFB function. He was a really nice guy. I was there. Alanis was there. Some other friends of mine were there. But yeah, um, it was quite a shock to me also when I heard the news as well. So uh, yeah, no, rest in power to Mr. Jeff Barnaby. Thank you for your thumbs. All right. 
Last words, anybody, before we close? Thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you to our audience as well. Um, we wouldn't do it if you weren't here. It's <laughs> very true, true, isn't it, Jean? We would, would do it with nobody but the filmmakers, but <laughs> well, that's, that's a festival. We really appreciate having an audience. Yeah. Yes, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you artists i it's one of my things i love being around people who are doing what they are meant to do and the three of you are doing what you're meant to do that art was absolutely stunning thank you so much for joining us tonight all right uh i am going to put a couple links into the chat of course our artists contact information well not their contact information but their websites how you can find more of their beautiful art uh i also am going to throw into the chat a link for our virtual donation bucket for indigenous film if you enjoy this series please and if you can please donate there we love making these films accessible for everyone especially with this new virtual that we can do so that link is in the chat right now and then i am also going to put in a link to register for our next indigenous film event on november 9th and that one is in person. So if you are in the Denver area and wanna come see indigenous film in person, I am going to put those registration links in there right now. Thank you so much to all of our artists. Thank you so much, Jean and Merv. And thank you everyone, our audience for dealing with me when Jean and Merv had to step away for just a second. I think we moved forward and I'm really, really glad that we came back because this conversation was absolutely incredible. So thank you everyone. I appreciate all of you and hopefully we will see you in person next month on November 9th. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye everybody. Hello. Bye bye. Yes.